Welcome to a journey through one of the most thrilling and unpredictable seasons in Formula 1 history, the 2016 Championship. Picture the scene, Lewis Hamilton, the 31-year-old reigning champion from Mercedes, riding high on a wave of back-to-back -back titles in 2014 and 2015. He was poised to chase a hat-trick of championship wins with the W07 Hybrid, a car seemingly unbeatable on the track, but the real suspense was brewing elsewhere. The burning question on everyone's mind wasn't just about Hamilton's potential hat-trick. It was whether Ferrari could rise to the challenge, injecting new life into the championship by taking on the dominant Silver Arrows. With Mercedes having claimed a staggering 32 victories in 38 races, since the turbo hybrid era began in 2014, the stage was set for a dramatic showdown. Was Ferrari's winter grind enough to close the gap? Join us as we relive the twists, turns, and high-octane drama of the unforgettable 2016 Formula 1 season. The big difference in the upbringing of Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton is very noticeable and often highlighted by journalists. Rosberg, an only child, was born in Germany but raised in the opulent surroundings of Monaco, and his father, Keiki Rosberg, a wealthy former Formula 1 world champion, provided a privileged backdrop to his early years. In contrast, Hamilton's roots trace back to a council estate in Stevenage, and he was raised in a more modest environment, with Hamilton's father having to work multiple jobs to finance his son's growing career in junior racing. Hamilton's journey into the world of karting started in 1993 at the Rye House Kart Circuit, when he was just eight years old. Swiftly rising through the ranks, he began collecting victories and cadet class championships, and on the other hand, Rosberg's karting odyssey began in 1991, when he was barely six years old. The duo first joined forces as teammates in 2000, still progressing in the world of karting, racing for Mercedes-Benz McLaren in Formula A. Hamilton claimed the European Championship, with Rosberg closely trailing him, but most notably, even in the early days, the competitive spirit extended beyond the track, as recalled by Robert Kubica, who raced alongside them before their Formula 1 careers. Kubica reminisced about their pizza-eating races, which, in my opinion, is a testament to their rivalry both on and off the circuit. Their karting mentor, Dino Chiesa, admitted that Hamilton possessed greater speed, while Rosberg excelled in analytical abilities. This divergence in their style started speculation that Rosberg, with his analytical approach, might outshine Hamilton in the peak of open-wheel racing Formula 1. The sport demands intellectual intelligence to manage intricate aspects such as brakes, energy harvesting, tire management, and fuel consumption. And contrary to expectations, Hamilton's superior tire management often allowed him to pursue more optimal race strategies. His fuel efficiency regularly outperformed his peers on the grid, and as Sky Sports' Mark Hughes noted, Rosberg has a more scientific methodology that looks to fine-tune more specifically than Hamilton, who typically tends just to find a balance he can work with, then adapt his driving around it. Formula 1 pundit Will Buxton compared the characters and driving stars of the two, acknowledging Hamilton as the faster driver with natural ability, but also possessing an intellect comparable to Rosberg's, and he highlighted Hamilton's strategic competence, emphasizing his fuel efficiency and tire management skills. But far from the perception of an unintelligent driver, Hamilton demonstrated intellectual parity with his teammate and proved to be the superior racer. Before their Formula 1 careers, Hamilton and Rosberg traversed different paths as Hamilton's journey began in 1998, when he joined McLaren's Young Driver Support Program, after expressing his aspirations to McLaren team principal Ron Dennis three years prior. Following victories in the British Formula Renault, Formula 3 Euro Series and GP2 Championships, Hamilton made his Formula 1 debut with McLaren in 2007, and in contrast, Rosberg clinched the 2002 German Formula BMW title and tested a Formula 1 car for Williams in 2004. After winning the 2005 GP2 Championship, he secured a spot as a Williams driver for the 2006 season. At the end of the day, the starkly different paths of these two drivers, from distinct upbringings to varying career trajectories, laid the foundations for a compelling narrative in the world of Formula One, one that would be written into the annals of history forever. Leading up to the 2016 season, Hamilton had already won two of his three titles against Rosberg. The 2014 season saw Mercedes emerging as the favourites, 
showcasing adaptability to the new regulations mandating turbo hybrid engines. The anticipated dominance materialized at the Australian and Malaysian Grand Prix, where Nico and Lewis secured commanding victories, significantly outpacing other teams. And despite Hamilton's early retirement in Australia due to an engine failure, the competitive spirit ignited at the Bahrain Grand Prix. A late safety car favored Rosberg, but Hamilton defended his position in a closely contested wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle. Tensions arose when it was revealed that Rosberg employed banned engine modes to gain a power advantage in Bahrain, and things further escalated as Hamilton discovered Mercedes had compiled a performance dossier for Rosberg, intensifying the intra-team rivalry. The Spanish Grand Prix provided Hamilton with the opportunity to surpass Rosberg in the championship standings, and he successfully fended off Rosberg's late charge, utilizing the same engine mode as Bahrain. At the Monaco Grand Prix, more suspicions arose when Rosberg's late incident in qualifying prompted yellow flags, hindering Hamilton's final lap, and despite suggestions of foul play, the stewards cleared Rosberg, but Hamilton declared an end of their friendship after finishing second in the race. The 2014 season saw another controversial incident at the Belgian Grand Prix, where Rosberg's collision with Hamilton was heavily criticized, to the point where it forced Rosberg to issue an apology, but some defended him against Hamilton's claim of intentional contact. The tide battle reached its peak in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, where double points were awarded and Hamilton secured victory, clinching his second world championship title, while Rosberg faced technical issues and finished 14th. Despite the intense rivalry, Rosberg displayed sportsmanship by congratulating Hamilton, concluding a season in which Hamilton amassed 384 points with 11 wins, while Rosberg secured 317 points with 5 wins. Entering the 2015 season, Mercedes once again showcased their dominance with the W06 Hybrid, completing more laps in preseason testing than any rival and utilizing just one power unit, which was, in and of itself, a remarkable achievement. The season opener in Australia affirmed their superiority, as the Mercedes duo secured a commanding 1-2 finish, leaving the third-place Ferrari over 34 seconds behind, which echoed the previous year's trend, with Mercedes outclassing the rest of the field. The title battle reached its peak at the 2015 United States Grand Prix, where Hamilton needed a victory to secure the championship. A thrilling race unfolded at the Circuit of the Americas, marked by intense battles between the Mercedes drivers and pursuing Red Bulls. Hamilton's aggressive move at Turn 1 secured the lead, and despite a spirited effort from Rosberg, a late mistake at Turn 12 allowed Hamilton to claim his third championship with three races remaining, and the post-race atmosphere was charged with tension as Rosberg expressed his displeasure, deeming Hamilton's Turn 1 move one step too far and refusing to partake in the customary champagne celebration on the podium. Hamilton concluded the season with 381 points, securing the FIA pole trophy for the most pole positions and the fastest lap award, and with 10 wins and 11 pole positions, he solidified his dominance. Rosberg finished the season with 322 points, clinching 6 wins and 7 pole positions, but ultimately falling short in the title race. However, the 2014 and 2015 seasons were just a warm-up for what was about to unfold next. In this abundant rivalry, of the two Mercedes teammates. The reason I want to be a Formula 1 driver is because it's got a lot of speed in it. Lewis Hamilton was born on January 7, 1985 in Stevenage, Hertfordshire, and he comes from a diverse background. His father, Anthony Hamilton, is of Grenadan descent, while his white British mother, Carmen Labalastier, is originally from Birmingham. His parents separated when he was two years old, leading Hamilton to reside with his mother and older half-sisters, Samantha and Nicola, until the age of 12. Subsequently, he moved in with his father, stepmother Linda and half-brother Nicholas, also a professional racing driver. Raised in the Catholic faith, Hamilton's early years were shaped by a family dynamic that navigated the complexities of separation. At the age of five, Hamilton's father ignited his passion for racing by gifting him a radio-controlled car. Demonstrating remarkable skill, Hamilton secured a notable second-place finish in the National BRCA Championship the following year, competing against adult competitors. And as the sole black child in his racing club, he unfortunately faced instances of racist abuse. Undeterred, his father gifted him a go-kart for Christmas at the age of six, laying the foundation for a promising racing career. However, the support came with a condition, excellence in academics. Hamilton's father, dedicated to his son's aspirations, made significant personal sacrifices. For example, after he left his job as an IT manager, he took on multiple roles simultaneously, working as a contractor, double glazing salesman, 
dishwasher, and even handling sign installations for estate agents, all while attending Hamilton's races. Eventually, he established his own IT company, continuing as Hamilton's manager until 2010. Hamilton pursued his education at the John Henry Newman School, a Catholic secondary school in Stevenage. At the age of five, he took up karate in response to bullying at school, and he was also involved in an incident that led to his temporary exclusion from school, which happened when he was mistakenly identified as the perpetrator of an attack on a fellow student who required hospital treatment. In addition to racing, Hamilton showcased his sporting versatility by playing football for his school team alongside future England international Ashley Young. A devoted Arsenal fan, Hamilton expressed his alternative career interests, admitting that if not for Formula One, he might have pursued a path as a footballer or cricketer, having actively participated in both sports at the school level. In his first Formula One season, Lewis Hamilton teamed up with two-time world champion Fernando Alonso, becoming the series' first and, as of 2023, the only black driver. Achieving a podium finish in his debut, Hamilton set multiple records finishing a close second to Kimi Raikkonen in the 2007 World Drivers' Championship. Notable records include the most consecutive podium finishes from debut with nine, the joint most wins in a debut season with four, and the highest points tally for a debut season with 109. But despite this success, Hamilton's relationship with Alonso and McLaren soured due to on-track incidents leading to the termination of Alonso's contract in November. Hamilton's triumphs continued in 2008, securing five victories and ten podiums. The season's finale in Brazil saw him win the championship in a dramatic showdown with Felipe Massa. Overtaking Timo Glock for fifth position on the final lap, Hamilton became the youngest Formula One world champion in history and the first British driver to claim the title since Damon Hill in 1996. Remaining with McLaren for four more years, Hamilton consistently secured podiums and victories. The 2010 season offered a shot at the title, but he finished fourth as Sebastian Vettel clinched his first championship, and the following year, distractions and clashes with FIA officials led to a fifth-place finish. Hamilton rebounded in 2012, winning four races and finishing fourth in the standings. Surprisingly, he announced a move to Mercedes for the 2013 season, succeeding the retiring Michael Schumacher, marking a significant shift in his career trajectory. Unlike Hamilton, Rosberg came from a better secured family as the only child of Keiki Rosberg, the Finnish racing driver who secured the 1982 Formula One World Championship, and Jezine Sina Rosberg, formerly Gleitzmann Dengel, a German interpreter. Due to his mixed heritage, with a Finnish father and a German mother, Rosberg holds citizenship in both countries. Initially competing with a Finnish racing license, he later switched to a German license, a strategic move to facilitate major sponsorship agreements. His early life involved residence in the Weisbaden district of Nordenstadt, followed by a lifestyle split between Monaco and the Spanish island of Ibiza. Rosberg received his education at the International School of Nice and the International School of Monaco and was encouraged to excel in both academics and sports. He was proficient in five languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Notably, his father prioritized the latter languages over Finnish or Swedish, deeming them more pertinent to Nico's life and career. Rosberg demonstrated a particular interest in mathematics and science, achieving an impressive grade of 1.2 after he graduated in 2002. At the age of four, Nico Rosberg had his inaugural driving encounter during a family holiday in Ibiza when his father introduced him to a go-kart track. Seated in a Jeep, Rosberg steered while his father managed to speed using the accelerator and brake pedals. His first taste of competitive racing occurred at six, and after witnessing his father in the Deutsche Tourenwagen Meisterschaft in 1995, Rosberg set his sights on a career in Formula One. During his karting journey, Rosberg participated in various championships, including the South Garda Winter Cup and the Super Formula A World Championship. His karting career ended with a notable third place finish in the Formula Super A World Championship at a race in Kirpen. These formative years laid the foundation for Rosberg's progression into the competitive world of motorsports. Rosberg's F1 career started in 2005 when he was signed by Williams as the team's second test driver. The decision followed extensive evaluations of Rosberg and fellow driver Nelson Piquet Jr., ultimately leading to Rosberg's selection. Collaborating with Williams test and reserve driver Antonio Pizzoni, Rosberg maintained his focus on the GP2 series a pivotal step in his career progression. The turning point for Rosberg came in September of the same year when race driver Nick Heidfeld sustained an injury in a bicycle accident. Rosberg found himself shortlisted as a potential replacement for the final two races of the season, the Japanese Grand Prix and the Chinese Grand Prix. 
Despite being considered, Williams ultimately chose Pizzoni to avoid jeopardizing Rosberg's career trajectory. With a potential delay of one to two years due to concerns about his performance, during the 2005 season, Rosberg did not achieve notable results. However, his breakthrough came in the 2006 season opener in Bahrain, where he secured his first career points with a seventh-place finish. Notably, he also set the race's fastest lap, making history as the youngest fastest lap setter at the time aged 20 years, 8 months, and 13 days. Rosberg's journey in Formula 1 continued with Williams until 2009. Subsequently, he embarked on a new chapter with Mercedes in 2010, where he encountered a two-year wait for his first Formula 1 victory. This breakthrough occurred in 2012 at the Chinese Grand Prix, a year before Lewis Hamilton joined the team, and it marked a significant milestone because this was the first victory for the new Mercedes AMG Petronas team formed by Ross Braun. Before the start of the 2010 Formula 1 season, Daimler AG, the parent company of Mercedes-Benz, made a strategic move by acquiring a minority stake of 45.1% in the Braun GP team. This significant transaction, finalized on November 16, 2009, was complemented by Arbar Investments acquiring a 30% stake, and with these changes in ownership, and in conjunction with a sponsorship agreement with Petronas, the team underwent a transformation, adopting the name Mercedes GP Petronas Formula One Team. Following the acquisition, the team, led by Ross Braun as team principal, retained its operational base and workforce at the 60,000 square meters Brackley facility. This location remained in close proximity to the Mercedes Benz Formula One engine plant in Bricksworth which was formerly known as Ilmore Engineering. The collaborative efforts of the team's leadership, combined with the infusion of resources and expertise from Mercedes-Benz, marked a significant step as Mercedes entered the Constructors' Championship for the first time in the team's history. This strategic move laid the groundwork for the subsequent years of competition in Formula 1 under the Mercedes GP Petronas banner. This year saw the return of the seven-time world champion Michael Schumacher, and he was partnered with Rosberg in the all-German Mercedes squad with high expectations, but unfortunately didn't deliver. Schumacher, while bringing experience, was eventually replaced in 2013 with Lewis Hamilton after he retired from the sport. The 2016 Mercedes team entered the season after an unbelievable testing, which saw the W07 hybrid not only ace the tests, but do that in convincing fashion, producing in excess of 900 brake horsepower. And the then engine boss Andy Colwell said that back then, it was the most powerful engine they had created. Mercedes had all it took to dominate this season, but I believe not even the most optimistic F1 fan could have expected a season like this one. The 2016 season saw the relaxation of engine development restrictions, which aimed to level the playing field for struggling power unit providers like Renault and Honda, allowing them to bridge the gap. Formerly restricted black areas, prohibiting modifications were now accessible, potentially pushing power levels beyond 1,000 brake horsepower for the best engines. Concurrently, both Renault and Honda had reportedly increased their power outputs by around 70 brake horsepower which placed them on a similar performance level. Additionally, exhaust system revisions, including the removal of the turbocharger wastegate chamber from the exhaust, aimed to enhance the engine's sound without compromising thermal efficiency and economy. Pirelli had also introduced a fifth tire compound to their range of dry weather rubber, with the purple ultra softs joining the orange hards, the white mediums, the yellow softs, and the red super softs. Furthermore, Building on the radio communications restriction introduced in 2015 to promote driver self-sufficiency by reducing engineer involvement during races, additional limitations were added on communication methods. Although teams had embraced radio transmissions, with many team principals viewing it as a means for fans to experience races from the driver's perspective, the primary goal was to enhance driver independence and allocate certain actions directly to them, minimizing reliance on engineers. Throughout races, teams could still use radio communications to alert drivers to on-track dangers, critical issues like punctures or overheating engines, and provide information on rival cars facing similar problems. However, from the one-minute signal until the race start signal, teams were no longer allowed to instruct drivers to go through the pit lane, move to the back of the grid, discuss the car's balance, switch it off, or perform radio checks. During grid reconnaissance laps, routine discussions were permitted, including plans for future laps, practicing starts from the pits, assessing the car's balance, 
moving to the back of the grid, conducting radio checks, re-entering through the pit lane, and advising incoming drivers of pit lane conditions. These changes aim to introduce unpredictability and the potential for human error, empowering drivers with more control over race strategy, engine modes, tire choices, and pit stop timing. The shift was to reduce reliance on algorithms developed by engineers and offered drivers greater flexibility to pursue strategic initiatives, addressing concerns raised by the Mercedes Duo in 2014 and 2015. The intention was to allow strategic errors made during the race to influence the outcomes, adding a layer of unpredictability to the races. The new qualifying session was also announced, which we know of today as well, and this was going to be the longest season with 21 races, and the grid also expanded to 22 cars, with the addition of the Haas F1 team. Points were awarded to the top 10 classified finishers in every race, with the winner getting 25 and the P10 driver getting 1. Mercedes were expected to dominate and clinch both titles fairly easily, but talk of the town were Ferrari and the champion duo of Sebastian Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen, because a great season was expected of both of them, having won only three races in 2015, with Vettel finishing P3, 103 points behind Hamilton. Hamilton then from Rosberg, accelerating up towards the main straight they go. The season started with the Australian Grand Prix and featured the newly introduced elimination-style qualifying format, which was heavily criticized by teams, drivers, fans, and the press, which led to a review of the format before the next race. The race ended with a 1-2 finish for Mercedes, with Nico Rosberg taking victory from Lewis Hamilton in second. This set the tone for an interesting season ahead, with Rosberg proving to everyone that Hamilton can be beaten. At the next race in Bahrain, following the widespread criticism of the new qualifying format, the teams voted to abandon it and revert to the system used in 2015. However, in the week before the race weekend, the Sports Strategy Working Group overruled the teams in order to keep the elimination style for 2016. That didn't phase Rosberg, who took his second victory of the season, ahead of Raikkonen and Hamilton respectively. The Chinese and Russian Grand Prix went Mercedes' way as well, with Rosberg also claiming victory there, and all eyes were set on the first drama event of that season, which happened in Spain. At the 2016 Spanish Grand Prix, Rosberg was leading 43 points and was facing a tough challenge from Hamilton, who secured pole position. Both drivers had a good start, but Rosberg overtook Hamilton around the first turn. However, a mistake made by Rosberg on the formation lap caused his car to enter an incorrect engine mode and, as a result, he was slower than Hamilton after turn 3, allowing Hamilton to attempt an overtake for the lead. During the maneuver, Rosberg forced Hamilton onto the grass, causing him to lose control and resulting in a collision that took both drivers out of the race. Despite mutual blame, stewards considered it a racing incident, citing Hamilton's justifiable attempt to pass, given his significantly higher speed of 17 km an hour which is about 11 miles an hour compared to Rosberg. Team chairman Nicky Lauda criticized Hamilton for being too aggressive, expressing regret over the missed chance for a victory. However, some, including 1997 F1 world champion Jacques Villeneuve, defended Hamilton, accusing Rosberg of dangerous driving. Despite the incident, Hamilton maintained that it did not strain his relationship with Rosberg, acknowledging a mellowing in their dynamics since 2014. This was one of the only two races that season that would have been won by a driver not in a Mercedes, with Verstappen taking his first victory. The next three races saw Rosberg winning only one, in Azerbaijan with Hamilton taking victories in Canada and Monaco, and going into Austria, Nico Rosberg was leading the Drivers' Championship with 141 points, 24 points ahead of Hamilton. This is where emotions would boil as another incident between the two teammates will happen, one that might have changed how they felt for each other when looking at it in hindsight. Hamilton started the race on pole position, but it was Rosberg who appeared on the road to victory, even though he struggled with a brake issue throughout the entire race. In the closing laps, Hamilton closed in on Rosberg, capitalizing on his struggles and on the last lap. A mistake by Rosberg at Turn 1 allowed Hamilton to gain a better drive toward Turn 3. Opting for the outside line, Hamilton moved alongside Rosberg as they approached the corner. However, when Hamilton turned in, Rosberg went straight on, resulting in a collision that damaged the German's front wing and Hamilton seized the opportunity, claiming the race win 
while Rosberg slipped to fourth in the final corners. Both drivers pointed fingers at each other, with Lauda placing blame on Rosberg. Team boss Toto Wolff, visibly furious, condemned the incident as brainless and warned of potential team orders in future races. Noting brake issues on both cars, Wolff stressed the near miss of a double DNF. Stewards held Rosberg responsible for the collision, issuing him two penalty points for not allowing racing room and causing the incident. For this incident with Hamilton, Rosberg was given a 10-second time penalty, but as he was ahead of Ricardo by 14 seconds, this didn't affect his finishing result. He was also reprimanded and given two penalty points for completing the race with a damaged car. The FIA concluded that this broke Article 12.1.1H of the FIA International Sporting Code, which states any unsafe act or failure to take responsible measures, thus resulting in an unsafe situation as a breach of the code. And as a result of the race, Nico Rosberg retained his lead in the Drivers' Championship, although Hamilton closed the gap to 11 points. In the next six races, both of the Mercedes drivers won three apiece, and going into the Malaysian Grand Prix, Rosberg was leading only by eight points, having reclaimed the lead from Hamilton in Singapore. The race started terribly for Rosberg, who not only had to deal with Hamilton being on pole, but also a Turn 1 collision with Vettel, causing him to go into a spin to the back of the grid, while Vettel damaged his front left suspension in the process, retiring after getting to an escape road a few corners later. But a massive moment happened on lap 41, which saw Hamilton retire from the race after an engine failure while he was leading. This opened the road for Rosberg to get P3 and extend the lead to 23 points before the final five races. Japan 2016 would be a memorable race for Rosberg as it was here where he got the last pole position of his career and the last victory. Hamilton fell to 8th at the start of the race due to a bad start, which was compounded by being on the wetter side of the grid. And for the second year in succession in the Japanese Grand Prix, all entrants were classified as having finished the race. With Rosberg winning and Hamilton getting P3, the German driver had enough of a lead in the World Drivers' Championship to win the title, even if Hamilton won all the remaining four races and he finished in second place every time. Of course, at the time, it was unimaginable that Rosberg would not win a single race out of the last four, but it started happening. Hamilton was driving out of his mind and won the next three races in the USA, Mexico, and Brazil, which we will get into more details later on. But Rosberg was also fulfilling his condition to finish at least P2 until the end. This set the stage for an unbelievable Abu Dhabi Grand Prix and the cherry on top for the 2026 F1 season. Rosberg was treated as an underdog even before the season started, no doubt about that. I mean, how else would you treat someone whose teammate had won two titles in a row the season before that, and this was betrayed various times throughout the season? The pressure mounted a lot on Rosberg, which proved the key reason for his retirement right after the 2016 season, with many of the media questioning whether he really had what it takes to be a champion. Then, there were the stories about him removing paint from his helmet, and he had stopped exercising his legs mid-season, as they'd lose some weight there and basically neglected his wife and family to concentrate as well as hiring mental coaches and a psychologist. How many of these stories are true, only a few people know, but it paints a picture of him going quite a distance to win. On his podcast, he also said he completely blocked out the media during that season for the first time which I personally found interesting, which basically meant he never once read anything about himself or a race during the season. He just let his people handle it all and minimize the media stuff on the weekends to the bare minimum, which allowed him to concentrate and thereby increase performance. If this was quantifiable in any way, it would probably account for maybe 1-2% to 2 better performance, I think. But the margins are so fine when they're fighting at the very top that anything that would improve you is more than welcome. Many people on the online polls agreed that Rosberg has what it takes to be a champion, and perhaps this was the case because people were simply bored of seeing Hamilton win all the time. After he announced his retirement, many media outlets talked about how the psychological strain of that 2016 season was too much for Rosberg and that it played a major role in his retirement straight after the Abu Dhabi race which we'll get back to later. That may be true, as fighting against a generational talent would be tiresome, 
even for a driver much better than Rosberg, judging by his quote. It feels like I've been racing him forever, Rosberg said about Lewis. He's always managed to just edge me out and get the title, even when we were small in go-karts. He's an amazing driver and one of the best in history, so it's unbelievably special to beat him because the level is so high. It really depends on which media portrayal you look at, but it is true that Rosberg was having a pretty hard time that season. From the beginning to the very end, he knew when to call it quits. Which is a feat that not many people can brag about doing, because mental health should be considered as something very important for an athlete of this caliber. So, big credits to Nico for knowing where his red line is. And he's crashed into his teammate! The two Mercedes come together! And the 2016 season had many mind-blowing moments for the title race, but there were several which I think were pivotal, not only in that season, but in the Hamilton-Rosberg rivalry, and more importantly, relationship. The duo established their friendship in the transition to Formula 3, maintaining their camaraderie as they ascended to Formula 1, and their relationship persisted even when Hamilton joined Rosberg and Mercedes in 2013. However, the dynamics took a turn for the worse. Tensions first escalated during the Monaco Grand Prix in 2014, when Rosberg seemingly obstructed Hamilton, intentionally impeding his attempt to secure pole position, and the strain intensified later that year at Spa, where the two collided. Mercedes attributed the incident to Rosberg, leading to a detrimental impact on his season. Further disagreement emerged the following year in Shanghai, where Rosberg accused Hamilton of jeopardizing his race. The animosity continued in Austin, where Hamilton clinched his third title, but provoked Rosberg by forcefully pushing him wide at Turn 1 to claim the lead, culminating in the infamous cap-throwing incident before the podium. After the incident at the Spanish Grand Prix in 2016, where both drivers ended their race prematurely, Rosberg admitted to resorting to mind games during the rest of the season to get the better of Hamilton. But although relations between them remained strained for a long time afterwards, they have gradually started to get back on better terms. One of the most significant cases where one driver was prioritized over the other was the Hungarian Grand Prix in 2014, where Rosberg secured pole position while Hamilton faced the challenge of starting from the back of the grid due to a fuel leak igniting his car in the initial qualifying session. Hamilton embarked on a mission through the field, and amidst this, a mid-race safety car altered the race dynamics which placed Rosberg behind Hamilton, but on a distinct strategy due to fresher tires. As Rosberg, with the advantage of newer tires, closed in on Hamilton, Mercedes requested the British driver to yield anticipating that the German would need another pit stop before the race concluded. Hamilton, who'd fought his way up from the last position, responded defiantly, stating, I'm not slowing down for Nico. If he gets closer, he can overtake. Consequently, Hamilton retained third place, successfully fending off Rosberg in the final stages following his pit stop. Mercedes suggested post-race that they believed Hamilton's defensive driving might have cost Rosberg, his primary championship rival, a victory. However, Nicky Lauda, the non-executive chairman of Mercedes, voiced support for Hamilton, stating, From my point of view, Hamilton was right. No disciplinary action was taken by Mercedes in relation to the incident after the race. Mercedes had otherwise done a pretty fair fight in most of the races in which Hamilton and Rosberg went head-to-head -head for victory. Moreover, Toto Wolff even criticized them for not being careful and sometimes costing the team valuable points in the fight for the Constructors' Championship. We mentioned this earlier, but we'll go a bit more in-depth later on. Despite the fact that Mercedes dominated the 2016 season, it wasn't a walk in the park like, let's say, Red Bull in 2023, because the team faced many challenges, mainly because both of its drivers competed for the title. You want to have a fair fight, which is a challenge in and of itself, and then the Hamilton problems in Malaysia and how you maintain that equality during the final race in Abu Dhabi. The main reason about why Mercedes was a well-oiled machine back then was because they approached their goals with a highly scientific methodology. Their primary targets, such as winning either the Constructors' Championship or the Drivers' Championship for the year, were evident. However, they also set specific targets for each race weekend, encompassing mechanical reliability to ensure the cars did not experience breakdowns or failures. Additionally, they focused on sporting reliability to minimize errors in race execution including strategy and pit stops, and the team placed significant emphasis on this aspect, employing various metrics for evaluation. But this was only the good side. There was a bad one as well. 
On the last lap of the Austrian Grand Prix, Hamilton attempted to overtake Rosberg into turn two, but Rosberg turned into the corner late on the inside and impacted Hamilton's car, damaging Rosberg's front wing and pushing Hamilton off the track. They almost touched again as Hamilton rejoined the track. Hamilton eventually got ahead into turn three as Rosberg nursed his damaged car to the finish line. This absolutely infuriated Toto Wolff and Nicky Lauda, who criticized Rosberg on the move, with Toto going as far as stating this. Brainless. It doesn't need a comment. We were marginal on braking. Nico had issues, and seeing both cars colliding is upsetting. It was an easy win, but just as easily it could have been a double DNF. It had been the second time in five races that the pair had crashed into each other, with the first accident coming at the Spanish Grand Prix, as well as minor contact at the Canadian Grand Prix. Wolf said that should a similar situation arise in the future, the team would contemplate settling the order of the cars by telling them not to race each other, though he admitted that such a decision would be unpopular. He made his feelings about possible team orders clear by saying, The thought makes me want to puke myself. But if racing is not possible without contact, that is a consequence. The team contemplated fines for the drivers if incidents like that occurred again, which underscored how completely fair the team was that season towards both Hamilton and Rosberg. During the final race in Abu Dhabi, Hamilton also ignored orders from the team because it wasn't necessary for him to win the race, but securing his title required Rosberg to finish outside the top three. To increase the chances of this happening, Hamilton employed a tactic known as backing up, strategically slowing Rosberg down to enable pursuers Sebastian Vettel of Ferrari and the young Max Verstappen of Red Bull to close the gap. The plan hinged on both Vettel and Verstappen overtaking Rosberg, which would have made Hamilton's win sufficient for the championship. In the final stages, both Vettel and Verstappen were in close pursuit as Hamilton deliberately refrained from accelerating, even after Mercedes issued two requests. Initially, Hamilton disregarded a race engineer's plea to increase his speed, and subsequently, he defied executive director Paddy Lowe's explicit order to accelerate, maintaining his strategy to impede Rosberg's decision and increase the likelihood of clinching the title. Hamilton was totally unapologetic over the incident in the post-race news conference, and instead complained about why the team didn't let him race because they'd already won the Constructors' Championship by the time the Abu Dhabi race came on the calendar. Rosberg's view was diplomatic, saying that you can understand the team's perspective and you can understand Lewis's perspective. Looking at it from this perspective, it's not that easy to have two of your drivers fighting for the championship, especially with a character like Hamilton who will never back down from a fight and will go at it until the bitter end. From the team's perspective, they only looked at what's best for the team rather than one specific driver even though it might look like the order was going to definitely take the opportunity for Hamilton to win the championship that season. It's one of those cases where it depends on how you look at it, whether from Hamilton's POV or Rosberg's. But even though it would not have been undeserved, even if Hamilton did win the title, I think Mercedes did the right thing. Nico Rosberg is second. He takes the championship 34 years after his father... After Rosberg's victory in Japan, Hamilton was under huge pressure to perform in the USA. Nico Rosberg entered the round with a 33-point lead over Hamilton in the World Drivers' Championship, and the Mercedes team held an unassailable 208-point lead over Red Bull Racing in the World Constructors' Championship, having secured the Constructors' title in the previous race in Japan. The Kota race went on without any major issues for the Mercedes drivers, with Hamilton and Rosberg both getting P1 and P2 in qualifying as well as the race. And while the difference at the end was 4.5 seconds, Rosberg had to fight back for that P2 spot after losing it to Daniel Ricciardo at the start. Seven days later, Rosberg now entered the weekend with a 26-point lead over teammate Lewis Hamilton in the World Drivers' Championship, as they were the only two drivers who could win the title at the start of the race. Rosberg had a massive scare at the start by going wide on the first corner, which almost cost him the race, but the 1-2 Mercedes victory was uncontested here, especially because both Max Verstappen and Sebastian Vettel were stripped of third-place podium finishes when penalized post-race. Verstappen crossed the finish line in third, followed 0.99 seconds later by Vettel, himself followed 3.55 seconds later by Verstappen's teammate Daniel Ricciardo. Verstappen was penalized 5 seconds for cutting a corner and unfairly maintaining his narrow lead over Vettel on lap 68. 
While Vettel attended the podium ceremony as the revised third place finisher, he was soon given a 10 second penalty for driving dangerously on lap 69, for moving under braking to block Ricardo as he attempted a pass, under new rules introduced at the United States Grand Prix the previous week. In Brazil, Nico Rosberg entered the round with a 19 point lead over Hamilton in the World Drivers Championship and needed a victory to win the title. Mercedes got 1 2 in qualifying, with Hamilton getting pole position, followed by Nico Rosberg in second. The track was very wet at the start, so the race began under a safety car until lap 8, and immediately Lewis created an early lead. And after a few restarts and delays due to bad weather conditions and track conditions, Hamilton went on to win the Grand Prix and further narrow the gap from 19 to 12 points, taking the fight to Abu Dhabi. In Abu Dhabi, the tensions were at their peak as Hamilton took pole position from Nico Rosberg on the Saturday, setting the stage for a very interesting finale. Both of the drivers were capable of winning the title, with Rosberg needing only a podium spot and Hamilton a victory. Hamilton held on to the lead from the start as Verstappen spun after a slight touch with Nico Hülkenberg, but he started the race on the more durable super soft tires in comparison to the top 10 drivers who started with ultra softs, and by the fifth lap of the race, Verstappen had recovered to 13th position and with only 19 seconds behind the leader Hamilton. Mercedes and Ferrari brought their lead cars, Hamilton and Raikkonen, in for their first pit stop on lap 7, and their following cars, Rosberg and Vettel, in subsequent laps. Red Bull also chose to react by pitting Ricardo at this time, fitting the yellow walled soft tires as did all the other front running cars at this point. Rosberg had a 1.6 second gap to the Ferrari of Raikkonen and maintained his position to the Ferrari after the pit stop, but now finding the yet to pit Red Bull of Verstappen between himself and Hamilton leading the race. This is where things got interesting, as Rosberg was advised by the Mercedes pit wall to not take any risk with Verstappen, believing that he'll pit soon allowing Rosberg to emerge back into clean air. However, Red Bull took advantage of this conservative approach from Mercedes and chose to run Verstappen as long as they could in the first stint in order to complete the race on a one-stop strategy and holding up Rosberg in the process. The risk posed by Verstappen's strategy to Rosberg became apparent soon, with Raikkonen following Rosberg close by and Vettel fast approaching this group. Rosberg was urged to attack and pass Verstappen on track, which he managed to do on lap 20 and began to catch Hamilton. With Raikkonen having pitted by lap 25 to cover for Verstappen and Ricardo, who both pitted on laps 22 and 24 respectively. However, the Hamilton character would soon surface. The Mercedes drivers opted for their final pit stops on laps 28 and 29, choosing the softer compound tyres for their final stint, and at this point, Nico Rosberg found himself with a comfortable 4 second lead over Max Verstappen, while Daniel Ricardo and Kimi Raikkonen trailed further behind. However, the complexion of the race transformed as Sebastian Vettel assumed the lead, executing a longer stint than his counterparts with the intention of concluding the race on the faster, super soft tyres. As Vettel continued to delay his final pit stop, Mercedes grew increasingly concerned about Lewis Hamilton's pace, and on lap 32, a message from the team questioned Hamilton's seemingly sluggish lap times, emphasizing the potential danger posed by Vettel. Hamilton swiftly responded by clocking a 1 minute 45.3 second lap time, but despite this, Rosberg expressed his dissatisfaction on lap 35, deeming Hamilton's pace as too slow, particularly considering the possibility of a late race safety car. The strategic chess game reached a critical point here, when Vettel eventually pitted on lap 35 to switch to the super soft tyres, and despite dropping to 6th place after the pit stop, Vettel's pace raised eyebrows within the Mercedes camp. By lap 41, Hamilton sought information from the Mercedes pit wall about the pace of the cars surrounding them, as Vettel's lap time of 1 minute 44.6 seconds was notably faster than the one stopping Verstappen, who was lapping at 1 minute 45.9 seconds. In a bold move, Hamilton adjusted his strategy by deliberately slowing down the pace, lapping in the 1 minute 46s. The rationale behind this strategic shift was twofold. First, to allow the chasing pack, including Vettel, to catch up, and second, to maintain a buffer against Rosberg, who trailed by approximately one second. This is where the unique layout of the track, notorious for its challenges and overtaking, played into Hamilton's hands, providing a defensive advantage. 
the unfolding drama took a turn as individuals within the Mercedes pit wall, including Hamilton's race engineer and the team's executive director, Paddy Lowe, issued repeated directives for Hamilton to increase his pace. But despite the mounting pressure from his own team, Hamilton remained resolute in his decision to control the tempo of the race. Vettel passed Raikkonen, Ricardo, and Verstappen, and was less than a second behind Rosberg by lap 50. Hamilton's actions also allowed Verstappen, who was 3.5 seconds away from Rosberg, to be one second behind Vettel by this time. In the penultimate lap, Vettel attacked Rosberg, who defended his position, with Red Bull's team also encouraging Verstappen to push up to Vettel's DRS to take advantage of a mistake by Vettel or Rosberg. Had Rosberg been passed by both Vettel and Verstappen, Hamilton would have won the World Drivers' Championship title and denied Rosberg his first title. Toto Wolff, the Mercedes team principal, was able to see two sides to Hamilton's actions, while not condoning his insubordination, understood the race's mentality in this situation. Others have supported him, going with the principle that drivers are free to race. What are your thoughts here? Let me know down below. Rosberg was finally a champion. After a grueling season, going up against one of the greatest drivers in the world, Lewis Hamilton, the German was finally on top of the F1 world. The celebration was massive, with him doing donuts at the finish line to commemorate a massive achievement. Everything from winning races to race tactics that take 110% out of the driver, it all paid off in the end. Rosberg's rivalry with Mercedes teammate Lewis Hamilton was one of the fiercest in Formula 1 history, with a pair battling for the title in the 2014, 2015, and 2016 seasons. And in the aftermath of the Abu Dhabi race, a mere five days later, Rosberg announced his retirement from the sport, absolutely shocking the F1 world. I was afraid that at some point I wouldn't be good enough and that no team would want me anymore. I wanted to decide for myself. While the decision to retire was not a difficult one for Rosberg, he did find it challenging to discover an identity for himself without Formula 1 in his life. In a way, I gave up my identity, he said. Everything in my life was racing. My mechanics, my engineers, my teammates, even my social environment. The pressure was massive for Rosberg, both mentally and physically. And in a way, it was to be expected that he was going to retire soon after the 2016 season, because not everyone can maintain that level of competitiveness and focus for years on end. Despite the initial challenges, Rosberg has gone on to build a successful post-F1 life for himself. He founded his own Extreme E team as part of his wider career as a sustainability entrepreneur and remains a regular face in the Formula 1 paddock in a punditry role. No matter what though, no matter how many titles Hamilton may win, Rosberg is always going to be remembered as the guy who drove Hamilton to his breaking point first. Rosberg's decision to retire while still at his peak was a bold one, and his subsequent success in other ventures is a testament to his determination and drive. His story is a reminder that it's never too late to discover new passions and identities and that success can come in many forms. Lewis Hamilton, on the other hand, admitted he felt quite disrespected by how Mercedes dealt with his controversial race tactics, but knowing him, he was always going to complain. The 2016 season is going to stay in the annals of Formula 1 history, as a season in which we saw everything. From controversies to domination, to nail-biting moments, to two teammates whose relationship went from friend to foe in less than one year. It will be remembered as a season where the average viewer wanted to watch every race, and every race you expected to get a new winner, which is something we rarely see since 2021 nowadays. For Rosberg, it was two races where he did not win this year, which truly earned him the title. His spirited fight back from contact at Turn 1 in Malaysia to finish third, before sealing the title in dramatic style in Abu Dhabi. Had he won from sixth on the grid in Austria, it would have easily been the standout win of his career, only for his questionable last lap defensive maneuver on Hamilton to cost him a place on the podium. Unfortunately, we'll never see Rosberg add to his list of wins following his decision to retire. His reasons for doing so are noble, but they also deny him the opportunity to win in a car which might not be the class of the field. Though a respectable decision, it also hints at a lack of fight in the 2016 world champion, a strange reluctance to defend the culmination of his life's work. His victory record that we've outlined unfortunately suggests the same is true, though 
though his decision to retire early revealed something else about the 2016 world champion. Courage, mental fortitude, and the knowledge of how to finish a job in the perfect and easiest fashion. And those traits, more than anything else, are how we should remember the career of Nico Rosberg. Hamilton would eventually go on to win the next four titles after that 2016 season, all with Mercedes, up until that 2021 season, equaling Michael Schumacher's record of seven world titles. It is a remarkable achievement for him, and while it's unlikely he will break Schumacher's record, seeing how things stand right now, the status of the greatest of all time will be up for discussion forever, and no F1 fan will ever forget him. Despite Hamilton and Rosberg's rivalry ending in 2016, by some prematurely, by many just when it needed, it shaped the landscape of the sport completely. As teammates, Hamilton and Rosberg won 54 of 78 races over four seasons. Hamilton had 32 victories and 55 podium finishes, and qualified ahead of Rosberg 42 times. Rosberg had 22 victories, 50 podium finishes, and qualified ahead of Hamilton 36 times. During this period, Hamilton won the Formula One World Championship title twice and Rosberg won the title once. At its heart, Formula One is a cauldron of competition, where the world's finest drivers and teams vie for supremacy on the world's most challenging circuits. The pursuit of victory is relentless, and the quest for the championship is a season-long battle that demands skill, strategy, and a machine finely tuned to perfection, and each race is a theater of high-speed drama where split-second decisions and precise execution can be the difference between glory and defeat. However, the true spirit of Formula One lies not just in the pursuit of individual glory, but in the art of competition itself. The fierce rivalry on the track is underlined by mutual respect and acknowledgement of the opponent's skill. In the heat of the battle, drivers like Hamilton and Rosberg push the limits of their machines and themselves, engaging in wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat where precision and daring are equally essential, and the respect for a worthy opponent is a symbol of true sportsmanship, a virtue that elevates the sport beyond mere competition. Sportsmanship in Formula One extends beyond the racetrack, as it is evident in the camaraderie among drivers, the acknowledgement of each other's achievements, and the ability to gracefully accept defeat. The handshake between rivals, the post-race interviews filled with mutual admiration, and the acknowledgement of a well-fought race are testaments to the sportsmanship that defines Formula One. In a sport where egos can be as powerful as the engines that roar on the track, the ability to compete fiercely and yet respect one's competitors is a quality that distinguishes the greats. The legacy of a Formula One driver is not measured solely by the number of championships or the races which they've won. It is a narrative made from the threads of moments of brilliance, displays of sportsmanship, and the indomitable spirit that defines their careers. The names of legends like Ayrton Senna, Michael Schumacher, and Lewis Hamilton resonate not just for their victories, but for the way they conducted themselves on and off the track, and their legacies are a blend of skill, determination, and an unwavering commitment to the sport they love. In the pursuit of legacy, Formula One drivers become ambassadors for the sport, inspiring generations to come. Their influence extends beyond the confines of the racetrack, shaping the narrative of Formula One as a spectacle that combines speed, skill, and sportsmanship, and the enduring impact of a driver's legacy is felt not only in the trophies they hoist, but in the hearts of fans who witness their greatness. We're thankful we witnessed a legacy and a title fight like Hamilton and Rosberg's in 2016, because that's what the sport is all about. The exciting moments the ones that keep you on the edge of your seat and make you talk about them for months afterwards. The Rosberg-Hamilton partnership is remembered for the intensity of their battles, both on and off the track. It showcased the challenges of managing two top-tier drivers within a team and highlighted the thin line between healthy competition and internal friction. It remains a pivotal chapter in the recent history of Formula One, offering fans thrilling races, controversial moments, and a glimpse into the complexities of managing competitive teammates within a team. And while we have had an even more interesting season since then in 2021, the uniqueness in the Mercedes rivalry of 2016 lies simply in the fact that it was teammates who fought for the title in the modern era, and that in and of itself is amazing. Thank you for watching The War of the Silver Arrows in 2016.
Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.